Hello, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with the Spirit of EQ, and welcome to the Spirit of EQ podcast. Life is a journey. Spirit of EQ helps shape and guide the road ahead for individuals, leaders, teams, and organizations striving to realize their full potential through emotional intelligence. Spirit of EQ is a coaching and consulting company that assists individuals and businesses to reach their full potential by developing emotional intelligence. In business, managers and leaders recognize the value of training to develop leadership skills. What they may not realize is that those skills are far more effective when they pay attention to not only performance, but also to people. Emotional intelligence is a crucial skill because people drive performance and emotions drive people. After this podcast, listen for a special opportunity to learn more. Today we have a very special guest, Dan DeLucia, who is the pitching coach for the Ohio State University baseball team. And joining me as always is Jeff East of the Spirit of EQ. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Eric, and everyone listening. So, Dan, welcome to the Spirit of EQ podcast. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. We kind of had a pre-podcast episode even before we started recording. And I, you know, I kind of stopped myself because I'm going wait a minute, we got to use some good material for the actual podcast. So I think I got a ton here. I'm going to give the listeners, Jeff, uh, a little bit of background on how I came to wanting to have Dan on. I've always been fascinated by baseball in general. It's probably because of my dad growing up. I mean, he was a big New York Yankees fan. Okay, I, I know, I know probably there's a ton of haters for the Yankees, but not now. Hold your fire. All right. <laughs> but that was a big influence on me. And I really, really was fascinated with uh, pitchers like Mariano Rivera. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, Greg Maddox was also someone, even though he wasn't a Yankee, and, and what they did. And uh, I've known Dan for a number of years, and with and I followed him when he was an athlete and his playing days and all that other good stuff. But now that he's in, in the mode of teaching, I call it teaching, coaching uh, these kids in, in, in a Division I school, I wanted to kind of get his insights about what he's seeing. I wanted to talk a little bit about the dynamic of the choice piece, right? Uh, and I know we talk a lot about that, Jeff, you know, here. A lot, yes. Um, and, and, and Dan, I haven't mentioned this to you, but the idea is, is that, right, 90% of your life is probably going to be the choices you make. Absolutely. You know, yep. and, and, and maybe the other 10% is all the goofy, unpredictable, couldn't have seen it coming stuff, good and bad, right? So I'm thinking the better we get at that model, uh, and as, as you guys are listening out there uh, in the audience, you, you know I do talk about this a lot, but the better we can get at making choices, it just creates better performance, better outcomes, better, I mean, happiness, all the stuff that we typically daily say we want. So that's that's another fascinating part. And then you've got some background, not only just in baseball, but you've got some business background. I want to talk a little bit about that as well. And then, of course, um, you know, we want to give you an opportunity to talk about some things you're you're into. So I'm going to dig right in. The majority of the people and kids that you're dealing with, right, they're, they've got to be what, 18 to 21, 22 ish. Yep. 18 right. to 22, some 23-year-olds. Okay, got all right. Your seniors. I, I've got a 20-year-old and an 18-year-old, and and I always am, am, am kind of observing and looking at them and their life, and I kind of, well, what's bugging them? What's, what's keeping them up at night? Because you hear so much about the pressure and the stress, right? So not only choosing a school, but also... I can't imagine, in, in a, again, a Division One school playing sports, additional pressure, additional stress. When you're seeing most of these kids that are coming in, are they are they stressed out? Are they are they pretty even, pretty positive? How, 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 what's your view on, on those folks? I think when guys initially come in, uh, there's excitement, which can cause a little bit of anxiety at times, yeah. but. Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot of stress. I guess some of that is just being out on their own for the first time. But honestly, they a lot of them it's ex excitement. excitement. You know, excitement. they they um, get you know out on their own for the first time, and you know they've always been the big fish in the small pond. They've always been the best at what they do wherever they came from. Yeah. Now they're at a place where they're maybe not the best, right? I mean, again, you're an 18 year old. Now you're getting to compete against and with 22-year-old experienced mm -hmm. seniors yeah, um, who have gone through the challenges and the ups and downs where 
you really haven't to this point in your life had a whole lot of adversity or challenges. So I think that's more so when we start to see the stress is when they start to fail a little bit because they've been successful, you mm. know, all of their all of their lives. So yeah, I've got a so these kids that are coming in, they were probably the best on their team. Or, or close to it, no doubt. Yeah, and we're we're trying to recruit some of the best players in the country, so no doubt they're they're the best in their team, league, and and in most cases the state. So when they come in, how how does it affect them when all of a sudden they're not the one on the team anymore because they're they're surrounded by people with equal or greater talent? That's where we sometimes see the stress. They're not sure necessarily how to handle it, and that's where you know we had talked before we got on air is is about their character. In the recruiting mm. process, we try to really dive deep, not only with with the uh, with the player, but the parents as well. Their background, how they grew up, what their drivers are, mm-hmm. uh, and really try to get a a good, well rounded picture of their character. So we'll talk to as many coaches and influencers. Mm-hmm. In their lives as, as we can to get a get Do that they, picture. I, I, I'm curious along that line, uh, Dan. I mean, character, right? For so many, is kind of this mysterious thing. Okay, what does it mean? I mean, is it that I never tell a lie, or is it that I'm I'm a person that doesn't give up? Whatever, whatever, right? Is that search designed because you guys know they're going to face some real challenges, mm-hmm. especially early on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the hard part is. Say you've got a quote unquote five star recruit, right? Okay, right. A stud that mm-hmm. we bring in. The hard part is when we get some reviews that say, you know what, he's not the best at handling adversity. He may not always have the utmost integrity that you would want in a single person, but man, this kid can pitch. You're going to want this kid on the mound when, uh, you know, it's a three two count in the bottom of the ninth and you need to get somebody out. So those are the the tricky. The tricky ones is obviously we want the integrity and the character to outweigh the the quote unquote X's and O's, right. or, you know how mm-hmm. hard you throw or how good you are as a yep. you know as a physical pitcher. But I think that's where my job and our job as a coaching staff and a program comes in and and taking kids that may not have that and molding them mm-hmm. um, into the guys that we want that can ultimately be the best of both worlds, great pitchers mm-hmm. um, and great people with with good character. Okay. Let's shift for a minute, Jeff. Dan, I want to let you talk about your background a bit because I know you didn't wake up last week and become a pitching coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, right. so tell me a little bit about your background uh, as when sports became sort of a dominant thing for you and then kind of pull it out into today sure yeah so i grew up um kind of in the hilliard area uh outside or uh in columbus went to bishop waterson high school and growing up just was a competitor right i have a, a younger brother brian who's three years younger than me so we would constantly be in the backyard competing with neighbors friends and um we just really didn't know anything else and i think it's just one of those qualities we we had internally so yeah. It really didn't uh, hit me that sports was was going to become a huge part of my life until really I started getting recruited, and, and I was a three sport athlete in in high school. So from a football and a baseball standpoint, started. And you were a recruited. very good quarterback. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I had a decent decent <laughs> yeah. high school career um, <laughs> as a quarterback. So, uh, but again, it, it was the competitive drive. I mm-hmm. loved competing. Mm-hmm. I loved. Um, wanting to win I don't know if it was it was wanting to win or just hating to lose I'm not you know it it could have been more of that but and I still to this day do I mean I still uh you know again what you know coaching 18 to 22 year olds I still you know put the glove on and and uh compete with those guys Mm because it's just uh it's kind of in my system but uh so once Ohio State was was drafted in 2008 by the Detroit Tigers and uh, bounced around the minor leagues with the Tigers and the Toronto Blue Jays organization and mm-hmm. the timing was great an assistant job opened up at Ohio State and you know at that point I was 26 years old and major league baseball had pretty much told me I was too old and and not good enough anymore <laughs> to uh to stay in the system and, right. and the next best thing to play in is coaching and you know, I've grown so much just from from when I started. Uh, Can I take you back to that too? Uh, yeah. When you 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 got the, I, I'm I would imagine nobody came to you and said, "Okay, Dan, this is from the major this is from uh, Major League Baseball. You're too old. 
and it's yeah. the end. Yeah. Uh, right. So how did you deal with the transition from, okay, this is coming to an end and I, and the new chapter is going to begin? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, and I try to tell our guys, it's a matter of perspective. And I try mm. to tell guys when they get drafted, you know, from Ohio State or out of high school here. And I try to tell them that once you get into that system, it's a business. It's a business. So I had that ingrained into my mind not to be emotional about the decisions that were made Mm. above me. I could only control what I could control, right? Yeah. And decisions were going to be made uh, whether I liked them or not. So it was the perspective I had with those decisions that helped me kind of transition out of the playing career into the coaching career. I know that, uh, and, and we'll we'll come back around to um, some of the things that are happening at OSU as far as uh, not only recruiting, but you know the day in and day out. But mm-hmm. you you spent some time also in the business world too, right? Right. Yeah. So actually, as a junior at Ohio State, I, I got I got my insurance licenses. One of my majors was uh, risk management and insurance. So got all my insurance licenses, and as a junior in college, started working part time at an insurance agency here in. Columbus. Okay. Okay. All right. And we've got some, uh, some questions around that dynamic and the connection between that and being a pitching coach. Um, because again, the, the pitching uh, piece was really, really one of those things, as I said at the beginning, that really kind of prompted me to go, man, I got to reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're dealing with kids, you know, we talked about adversity. We talk about you're looking at character, you're doing the background thing. You said something to me earlier that you guys are recruiting like really, really early on. How does can you repeat that one? Yeah, back to, as yeah. Far as so me again. recruiting has changed significantly since since we were getting, or since I was getting recruited back in you know the early two thousands, and you know I committed to Ohio State as a senior, actually spring of my senior year, so I only had three month, two three months left of my whole high school playing career when I committed to Ohio State. Now we're, we're recruiting freshmen sophomores uh, in college, so the recruiting cycle has has definitely changed. With baseball specifically, uh, we can't bring guys onto campus until they're juniors. So a lot of our recruiting has to be through high school coaches, through summer coaches, and just talking to these, you know, 15, 16 year olds over the phone and trying to get to to know them without Mm -hmm. sitting across the table from them, looking them in the eye, shaking their hand, you know, things that you would do uh, a lot of times in a normal recruiting process. So it's definitely different, and you have to find ways to be able to do that effectively. Do you see that as a is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing that we're recruiting so early? I mean, if, if, I mean, if you were king for a day, would you say, yeah, keep it the way it is? Or and Personally, I, I would push it back to where it was. Even you know, I think a lot of times these kids are so anxious, especially with the social media world, to jump out there and tell the world, hey, I'm committed somewhere. And they see their friends doing it, and they just feel that – they want to get it over with. They want to get the, the decision made. And and frankly, they're they're 15 years old. Some of them haven't. Some of them had committed before even stepping foot in a high school or without a driver's license. Mm. So the decision making that they're they're trying to make as um, you know, just really into their teenager years, I, I'd like it to be more of a thought out process. Yeah. I feel like it moves so fast for them because then on the back end you see decommitments all mm-hmm. over the place and you hear about it in football and basketball and it happens in in the baseball world frequently and it's because guys just they feel like they're forced to make decisions yeah so early and and we talked about earlier how the collegiate world is an arms race there there's always a a, a race a I guess a competition to do better than than other mm-hmm. schools not only with facilities but uh, social media, and it's just become an epidemic uh, to, I think, the detriment of the kids. Because I think about it, you know, Jeff and I have spoken on the podcast and even outside of it, you know, that this idea of how we're going about making our choices, uh, it's not uh, going to be lost on anyone who's listened to this show for any time that we talk a lot about, you know, what is emotional intelligence? Mm-hmm. It's the blending of your thoughts and your emotions to make optimal decisions Mm -hmm. and maybe because i've got enough time behind me now to look back and go Mm -hmm. 
I can't blame anyone but me. That was my choice. I I decided to go left or go right, you know, Mm -hmm. and I know for my kids um, and by extension, you know, uh, friends, family, whatever, you know, uh, there's always this idea that we can't be perfect, but man, we can get better. Right. There's no perfect fastball. Right. Dan. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But no, you you can get better. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to pivot for a minute to uh, a video that I saw on Twitter. And and it was uh, I I think it was from you, and basically it was showing uh, these pictures and learning proper form. Mm-hmm. And I may be over generalizing that, so uh, I apologize. But it was fascinating to me as I'm looking at that kid and seeing him trying to 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 do what maybe wasn't supernatural, right? I mean, mm-hmm. in the sense of of form and maybe what he had been learning before. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of a two-parter, do you guys have to work on changing some of the mechanic type stuff that maybe they learned in high school when they get into college? And then, uh, what do you watch for maybe potentially when, when a kid is encountering, in this case, you know, practice adversity, right? Mm-hmm. You know, cause I got to imagine just by looking at that kid, it was like, I could see it was getting a little frustrated because mm-hmm. it was, it was like. Okay, I'm I'm trying, I'm trying. So let's go back to that. One, one the the first part is: d- Are you finding yourself? Do you guys have to clean up stuff or change a bit? Uh, we do. The what we usually do. So going back to when guys first come in right. a, as freshmen, honestly, what we do initially is just let let them be. So again, we talked about new environment. There may be some anxiety there. We know there's some excitement, oh, but wow. yeah, they they've clearly done things in their high school career that are good enough to be at Ohio State. Right. Right. So Mm -hmm. we almost want to just encourage them initially, like, hey, we're not here to change you. Mm -hmm. You've already you're already good enough to obviously be on the team. Right. Right. So we try to make, you know, after a couple weeks, few weeks, um, again, if they're succeeding, we we continue to to let them be and let them ride and just keep, you know, uh, patting them on the back and mm-hmm. uh, encouraging them for the most part, maybe with with small tweaks here and there. Yep. But then obviously, you know, that's when the guys start to fail when they come in. That's where we will make adjustments and try to get them right. Again, you know, kind of in line with this podcast, a lot of a lot of it when they come in it is mental. And it's that mm. finding what their driver's in. We'll have weekly pitchers meetings where we sit down and we're not talking baseball. We're talking – more than that. And, mm-hmm. and a friend of mine brought to me uh, a year or two ago this concept of MVP, and it's the your mission, vision, purpose, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, I've used yeah. that with our guys. And I've done it personally. I would encourage people to do that personally and, and to figure out, you know, outside of baseball, why do you wake up every day? Mm-hmm. What are you doing internally that influence, influences those choices that we're talking about? So yeah. we'll sit down and go through – pitchers meetings and just talk about them as people right so that when they're up on the mound like you said mariona rivera Mm -hmm. is up on the mound in front of fifty thousand people and who you know millions and millions of people you know in game seven of the world series how is he able to throw that cutter and not worry about what's going to happen right clearly the best in the game have some physical attributes that you know a lot of people can't repeat or I should say replicate, but internally they are so secure with who they are and that no matter what happens, good or bad, they're still going to be the, the same person when they get out of bed the next day. So yeah. it, it's kind of the those measures that we really try to instill into our guys. Who are you? Know yourself in and out really, really well. So you've got it. We're talking pitchers. Mm-hmm. So you've got that pitcher. He's going into the ninth inning. He's pitching a shutout. How much of that character goes into him getting those last three outs? Yeah, if we're talking a closer, I mean that that's not not pretty... a closer, but he's the he's the starting pitcher and he's got he's pitching a shutout. Sure, I mean and and, and so he's tired. Yeah, that's something. That's where you have to know your guys. And I'm, I don't stand a lot. I'm not. I'm not trying to say I'm unique as a pitching coach from this perspective, but that's where you get to know your players. That's where those pitchers meetings at the beginning of the year in the fall mm-hmm. really matter 
So when you're in June at the end of our season in, in conference tournament or regionals in the NCAA tournament where pitches really, really matter and innings really, really matter, it goes all the way back to the beginning of fall where we get to know our guys. And are these guys emotionally stable where they can handle situations? Are they a guy that you know is going to say, without even asking him the question, is going to say, do not take the ball out of my hands? Let me finish this. Let me go after this. And and it's kind of the the balance between you may have a guy like that who has, you know, grit or guts or whatever you want to call it, but there's also some of that wisdom that says, I know he wants to finish it, but he's he's absolutely gassed and I've got to take the ball even though I know he wants it. So that's that's kind of the give and take of of my job is really knowing these guys when and having those the choices. trust. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. that's that's powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, my wife has um, been very, very into uh, the Enneagram. I don't know if you've oh, heard yeah. of that. Absolutely. Okay. And Jeff, yep. I know we've I'm talked about I'm a nine. About <laughs> I see. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and um, so, and this is germane uh, to that, uh, Jeff, I, I'm a four, and I think you knew that. Um, uh-huh. But my wife, we're sitting on the couch, and um, – just talking in general. And she says, well, see, with you being that creative artist type, you, you see things through that lens and it, it, it impacts you uh, differently than what it would someone else because emotions are part of your, mm-hmm. your triad, if mm-hmm. you will. I think that's the, I'm, I'm learning. I think that's mm-hmm. the term. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and going, wow, you're right. That is how it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even though I didn't have a baseball in my hand, it would be like her coming out to the mound and saying, "You process with emotions. That's not here. Mm-hmm. You, you gotta, you gotta give me the ball." And, and I, and I, I think about that because I know we, you don't weaponize the Enneagram. <laughs> I've heard right. that many times yes. because I know some people out there might be thinking, "Oh, is your wife, you know, trying to tell you about who you, what you should do?" Tell you, <laughs> it, it's truly not that um, because you know. I just think it's fascinating, Dan, your your emphasis on knowing them and what that produces in your ability. And I, I got to believe that would, in some ways, that, that engenders like trust on their part, that you went there first. No, no doubt. I mean, it, trust is the name of the game. And one of my favorite books uh, is called The Speed of Trust um, who's the, who's by the Covey. Yeah, yeah, Covey, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, and I wrote that, I wrote this down as you were talking and we, we tell guys, that, you know, guys can act with emotion, but you don't want to be emotional if mm. that makes sense, oh, right? Yeah, so yeah, it does. when I say act with emotion, you know, if you're in a tight situation and you get a guy, you punch a guy out, you know, strike three on the outside corner looking and you give a fist pump, that's acting with emotion, mm-hmm. right? But being emotional is kind of that. That roller coaster of emotions that we try to stay out of. Who right? was it? Was it Cece Abathia? Mm-hmm. I think was the one. If you could get him upset, he was done for the game. Oh sure, sure. He I would just see, yep. melt down. Melt down, sure. And teams use that against him, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's little <laughs> things that can get guys like you know you step out of the box numerous times just to get a pitcher fired up, and there's a bunch of different things you can do <laughs> to upset pitchers. But but again, that's where we try to train our guys like. It doesn't matter. You can't control those things. You can't control that. You can't control umpires. You can't control weather. Mm -hmm. That's the emotional side that we train our pitchers more than anything. Again, these guys are already good coming out of high school, right? So there's obviously physical tools or, you know, physical adjustments that we're making in these guys, but, but more so. And, and we, again, we, I tell these, I tell our pitchers this, but, um, there's kind of this, uh, I guess, phrase in baseball that 90 plus percent of baseball is mental, right? Mm-hmm. Well, constantly coaches are training the physical. We're, we're throwing, running, catching, hitting constantly. So if 90 plus percent of the game is mental, then why are we practicing the physical part of the game 90 plus percent <laughs> of the time, right? Wow. It doesn't match up necessarily. So what we try to do is really hammer on that mental part of the game. Because, I, because you know, when it comes down to it, that's really when, to gain an edge over another pitcher, or over the batter, or over another team, mm-hmm. especially when there's thousands of people in the stands, that's really uh, the part that's going to come to fruition um, when things, uh, hmm. you know, mean, mean the most. 
in the business world, I've heard a lot of companies say that same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we can teach somebody the task in the business, but they don't know how to do everything else. The emotional, the getting along, the no, it's kind of that you can't you can't teach character. You can't right. That's it, not you know it's not it's not like knowing how to do an Excel spreadsheet, right? Mm-hmm. So successful companies now are looking at that other. I hate to use this term soft skills because they're very hard to learn. Yeah. But those things like what you're talking about, how to handle the emotional part of, of your pitcher's job or somebody yeah, that's really, at work. That's mm-hmm. interesting, Jeff, too. And um, I haven't talked to you about it, but, you know, Dan, you're talking about, again, that that idea of, of emphasizing the mental piece. And I talked to a client last week that basically said they looked at the emotional intelligence piece as the foundation for the other types of training that they were going to do because they felt like if, if we get this piece down, these other things will line up a lot better than if we didn't, if, mm-hmm. if that makes sense, you know, because okay. I can't imagine, right. Number one, the pressure of being on the mound, right. And, and you're in front of friends, family, strangers, mm-hmm. tons of people, you're in a D one school and all that different stuff. And then add in, I broke up with my girlfriend last night and then add that in. I I was kind of sick to my stomach this morning (laughs) and then add in, I really hate this guy, you know, (laughs) and then having to pull that together, right. Right. To be able to still perform for the team. Right. Right. I'm going to shift a little bit to um, some of your experience um, just, just in life stuff. Right. I mentioned about the transition from going from when you were exiting the major league because you, you you left the major league into to the business world, right? Was that the pathway or? So I had had a role with an agency since I was a junior in college, right around to to when I left uh, or so when I got out of uh, major league baseball. So okay. I got hired as an assistant mm-hmm. um, at Ohio State and literally within a couple months, I had an opportunity to be a partner in a essentially a startup insurance agency. Okay, and, and again, that goes back to again the choices that I alluded to earlier. Is I didn't have all the you know, and from that risk assessment standpoint, mm-hmm. I didn't know how that was going to turn out. And just frankly, and and my business partner told me you know that I tended to do this a lot is I was hedging, right? So when I went into Coaching, mm-hmm. right? Coaching was my passion. Coaching is what I love to do. Yep. There was another side of it, though. So there was this entrepreneurial, lucrative business uh, piece of it that was, again, frankly, just more financially rewarding. Right, right. Uh, so there was a balance. And for me, I was hedging a little bit on I can have the bo- the best of both worlds and, and literally worked two full-time jobs. And it's funny, you know, People in baseball have no idea I had another full time job in in insurance, and then the insurance clients of mine and people had, had no, no idea. idea I was a an assistant coach for Ohio State. Right. So, and for about five years, uh, but again, that goes back to the choices. I trusted that the guy I partnered with had similar qualities mm-hmm. um, and, and a vision where, where we had similar synergies. Mm-hmm. That paired up really well and ended up being a really great decision. One of my, uh, he's not only a a great friend and mentor, but I helped me learn a lot from the business standpoint that, again, we might get into it, that parallels a lot to to coaching. Yeah. So So that maybe uh, you you've given the best segue possible. Let's let's go ahead and go there. What do you see are some parallels to to what you saw in business and what you see in in coaching pitchers? There's two. I'd say managing people. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, when, you know, everything in life, and I'm not the first person to say this, is, is based on relationships, yeah. in my opinion. And, and uh, the trust or, or, you know, mistrust or distrust of relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing was just in my role, I was in sales, right? Mm-hmm. So I was, in, I was selling uh, insurance products all over the country, mm-hmm. very niche-focused mm-hmm. insurance products all over the country. And and now I'm selling 15 year olds on why they should come to Ohio State. <laughs> right, right, right. So there's there's definite. Hey, wait a minute. That, yeah. could, that could we could create 15 year old mentality yep. to you know the sales <laughs> in the business. <laughs> right. There's definite. There's definite parallels there because mm. uh, you're dealing with people and yes. you're dealing with 
you know, again, in segue with this podcast is emotions. And it's funny, I was just reading a, a, a book called uh, Never Split the Difference uh, by Chris Voss. And he was an FBI negotiator for at least a couple deck guys, a top FBI negotiator. And one of his biggest things is talking about anchoring emotions. Anchoring, mm-hmm. and you're talking about he's dealing, he's negotiating with some of the top terrorists in the world. And it, and it comes down to the same thing. So whether we're talking selling insurance, mm-hmm. selling whatever your product or service is, selling a, a product, and honestly, ourselves as a coaching staff and a program to 15-year-olds, mm-hmm. um, or, or negotiating with terrorists, it comes down to emotions. So you have to be able to figure out what those are. And, and a lot of it is empathy. A lot of it is trust. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm still learning. I don't know it all here. Oh, but, but Dan, you but, know, you, you got it was going through my head. It's like Jeff, the 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 whole idea of that emotions are chemicals and and they're they're neurotransmitters, mm-hmm. right? So I, I say this a lot. I know you do as well. When we work with people, is that don't judge your emotions as being good or bad. They're trying to tell you something. Mm-hmm. Now, what you do with them. Right. You know, it's kind of that idea of anger is bad when you lose your temper and you scream. Right. right? Anger is good when you stop for a moment and you reflect on what it why am I angry? What is what is what what are the consequences of me not controlling this? And I get it. People could say, well, easy for you to say, Eric, in your podcast, sitting in that nice, cushy <laughs> room, right? Uh, right? Well, don't worry, folks. I'm going to be leaving here, and I'm going to go home, and I got a family, and I got a neighbor, <laughs> and I got, mm-hmm. I got a car uh, repair person who's got to call me back because I got issues with my car. Right. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be a much slower than what I think it's going to be. Right. Plus, <laughs> all the people that you're going to meet on the freeway heading home. Yes, right. Oh, are, yeah. You know, and of course, in Columbus, Ohio, we have the best drivers on the planet. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. I, I'm sure there's research that shows that yeah, somewhere. Right. Um, <laughs> so within that, you know, you talk about with the FBI guy, you talk about your situation. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the better you're able to recognize, you know, that, you know, the anger is not some like, it's not bad, you know, just like sadness. And, and you know, it just like, you know, joy is not absolutely a positive thing because that can lead you into places mm-hmm. you don't want to go. Mm-hmm. So, with that in, in in the parallel, what about um, what, what do you see if if and again not not going into the technical definitions of emotional intelligence and all of that, but would you say that the majority of the kids that you talk to are pretty emotionally intelligent, just at a high level? No. Okay. No, because there's so many external influences in their lives that they almost don't even have a chance to know who they are. If you take out all those external influences, and and I do this exercise, and again, a, a lot of my tools I learn from other people, which... Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, but I, I tell people, if you were to rank yourself 1 to 10 on a scale, take out all the all the roles in your life, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like we're a father, a husband, I'm a coach. I was an insurance salesman. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a lawn, I mow lawns. So I'm a lawn mower. I take yeah. out the trash. I'm a trash taker outer. Yeah, right? yeah, take yeah, out right. all the roles in the lo- in your life. And where do you rank yourself one to 10? And a lot of people are like, man, if, if I'm not playing baseball, if I'm not doing that, I'm probably, I don't know, a two. Mm. And, you you know sometimes there's maybe one or two hands that have their and again I I did this exercise and I yeah. I said yeah. I was a two right so yeah. I don't have it all figured out I'm just yeah. this is experience but yep. there's maybe one or two people that have their hand up that say I'm a nine or I'm a ten or I'm an eight higher on that on that spectrum and I ask them why and it's because I know who I am I don't need roles to define me I know what drives me internally and. If that role uh, goes away, I still know what defines me. I still know who I am when I wake out of bed. I still and know isn't what that me. Dan? Doesn't that connect into the performance on the field? Absolutely. As That's that what I'm goes saying. up, right? You ask Mariano Rivera if he got a home run hit off him in the bottom of the ninth and blew a save. I bet he'd still wake up in the morning and have a pretty good idea of who he is as a person. Yeah, because that's one thing, and I think uh, my kids are 
my last, uh, my youngest is going to be out of high school soon, but I, I thought, and I've always felt this about a lot of their friends too. There's so much emph- emphasis on performance, your ACT score, where you're going to go to college, what are you going to do for a career? Where are you going to live? And we want you to be the best. We want you to be the highest. What's your score? What, what did you rank? All of these different things. Mm-hmm. And then when you ask, so what have you done to prepare them for that beyond just the skills? Like, has anyone introduced an MVP? Mm-hmm. Has anyone said emotional intelligence? How do you make decisions? That's when you get the awkward silence because we don't spend any time on it. No doubt. And sometimes I think, Dan, we're setting them up for super disappointment and failure because as much as we can tell our kids, right, uh, that, you know, they're special, they're wonderful, they're special, they're wonderful over, over, over and over again. And quite frankly, they are, we love them, but they're going out into a world and I'm just going to be blunt, right? I think we all know this, that really doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Nope. You know, in, in adulthood, I know for me, I probably got maybe a handful of people that really care about me. I was going through this exercise uh, with a gentleman of, um, it's like the, I I don't know what the name of the exercise, but it's the idea of drawing like three circles around each other. And you're in the center, got your name. And then in the exercise, you, you put the initials of all the people in that first circle. And those are the people who, if you called them, they'd say, I'll be there right now. And if, if you were vomiting on carpet, they would, hey, let me clean that up. Let mm-hmm. me clean that up for mm-hmm. the next circle. People that maybe wouldn't go that deep, but they would try to help you get a ride or, or fix something. And then that next circle. And the whole idea this guy told me, he said, the more initials you have in those circles, the better you're going to be when life turns out to be that ferocious monster that it is. So the people that have the greatest challenges, and this goes from the mental well-being across, they're isolated. They don't have that. And for the life of me, again, for all of our desire to see whether it's our kids or even our friends, adults, to do great things, we leave all that stuff in the dust a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, You're making me think of of your these kids, 18 to 22-year-olds coming in. How good are they at being in that inner circle for their teammates? A, t- Ooh, a closer that's good. blows the game. Mm-hmm. The outfielder misses a fly ball and loses the game. How good are they at being in that inner circle for their teammates when somebody does something like that? It, 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 does it come naturally or do you have to teach or encourage? Yeah, so there's um, there's three things that we have and we call our cultural blueprint for our guys and our guys, these should be the foundations of our program. And the the third one's brotherhood. Mm. And, and again, we're not the only program to preach brotherhood, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it is something that we want because again, these, it's, you got to think beyond baseball, beyond this, you know, life where they think they've got everything figured out. And, you know, a lot of these guys are going to be in each other's weddings and friends for a really long time. And, so we try to influence and help facilitate uh, that brotherhood. And we want that to be as strong as anything. And, and I'm sure if you talk to coaches that have won national championships or Big Ten championships, I bet they'll say that more so than anything, it was the camaraderie and the brotherhood of the guys they had uh, in the locker room. And that rings true for us as well. It's the best teams that we've had. Yeah, they're talented, but man, when they really came together and played for each other, mm. didn't necessarily even play for the championship, to play for you know their own individual staffs. When they played for each other, that's when we saw great things happen. Championships, rings, all that. Mm. And they weren't even playing for it. So when when you talk about you know a guy blows a save in the ninth inning, it's... First of all, how does he respond, right? But he's going to respond a lot of times based on his brothers, his brothers, his teammates on the team. Uh, So that's a great point. I think some of the best teams we've had have have made that almost the number one driver um, within the program. That's a great point. So how can we take that into the business world, into our personal life, I think is what we need to talk about. (laughs) 
Uh, you gotta Not be necessarily ca- now. Well, you got to be careful, Jeff. Dan's going to start charging us by the hour. Oh, no. <laughs> those kind of questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I, I mean, I'll jump. I mean, that's a great point. Again, it's th- these are parallels, right? And it all comes down to the relationships, in my opinion, and getting to know the people. So I had, let's call them account executives that were working for me that did all the clerical work that <laughs> I wanted no part of. I wasn't good at, you know, I was a salesman. <laughs> I wanted to sell and that's what I thought I was good at. But they're still members of the team and just as valuable because if they leave, if they walk out the door, well, guess who is doing all that stuff? The stuff that you don't want, you're going to end up doing it. You're going to end up, you know, putting on multiple hats. And, and what I found to be uh, effective uh, in the business world. And, and, and I would hope the, the people that I worked with felt the same way is that again, I cared with them. I asked what, well, same thing I do with our players, right? The, they're MVPs, figuring out what their their emotional drivers are, what meant the most to them, and then just help raise them up. To, I mean, just tell them how good of a job they were, they were doing, what their ambitions were in the workplace. So it all felt like we were moving in the same direction. Again, never talking about necessarily goals of our companies, but – making coworkers feel that they were as important as anybody as important as my kids, my wife, and really make them feel like what they did mattered on a yeah, day. And basis. you know what, Dan, you know, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking about what leaders can do to foster that, um, sense of, um, I mean, again, it's coming back to trust. You know, if I'm just beginning the journey with you, I don't really know you that well. I got I, I'm. I went out on my proverbial limb to. I'm going to do this, sure. and I'm going to. I'm going to choose you, or I'm going to choose this team, or whatever. And and it comes back to that idea about salt and light. And I think about salt. Right, you're at a dish that you really worked hard on, and it was really good. Mm-hmm. You know, took the first bite, and you knew. You grab the salt. Yep. You sprinkle it on a little bit more, and what happens? The dish totally changes. Mm-hmm. Your impression of it, your feeling about it. It's almost like you have that. That's what I was looking for. That's what I was hoping for. Mm-hmm. Right. The light part is purely. I mean, think. I mean, I, I don't want to go overly spiritual here, but we live in a fairly dark world. I don't think that's lost on just about everyone. Right. Mm-hmm. So when you encounter someone who is, hey, I see you. Tell me more about you. Mm-hmm. And this, that's the constant refrain. That's light. That's like, whoa, wait a minute. You see me? And I, I mean, even I believe even the five star guys sometimes. Yeah, I mean, they've gotten applause. You're the greatest. You're the most. You're the most. Over and over. But how many people said, I get that. But tell me, what are you into? Mm-hmm. What, what kind of stuff do you do when you're, you know, and the eye contact, that sense, right? I think that gets lost in the leadership ranks, people forget that when that first meeting and, and that's, there's a dangerous part, I think, is that we make our decisions very quickly about whether or not this is somebody to trust mm-hmm. or not to trust. I mean, I, I think it was Gladwell's book, right? Blink, you know, mm-hmm. his idea yep. that it takes a human being like maybe five to seven seconds. Well, as soon as we get done recording this podcast, we're going to talk about bias. Oh, <laughs> that's the next one going to be. <laughs> All right. Good one. All right. So the idea, we make up our minds very quickly. And I've used that with people. I was like, hey, I get it. You, you, you had a tough situation before I came on the scene. And but the reality is you've already decided whether or not I'm somebody to be trusted. Mm-hmm. You know, I hope I did well. I, I, I hope you see that I can be trusted. But I walk into the rooms going, I know that's the measuring stick because that's human beings. And my things are typically, right, we, we come in and we go. I mean, we're the quasi-consultant. You know, we're not staying there from beginning to end. So if you're working for that company or if you're a coach on part of a coaching staff, I would think it's got to be huge to be able to establish that very quickly, salt and light. So anyway, that kind of you got me thinking about that Mm -hmm. that part so no yeah great point all right so dan what is going on in life for you what's what's going well um what are you excited about what's getting you up out of the morning up up in the morning besides osu baseball 
Yeah, well, right now, it's funny. I'm right in the middle of a 21-day fast, so <laughs> I'd really like some uh, food <laughs> is the first thing I think about. But, um, no, we, my wife and I, we do it with our church every every year. And uh, uh, honestly, well, it's— Well, I got to keep you there mm-hmm, for a minute. Sure. I mean, when I'm thinking 20—you're not talking about intermittent fasting. You're talking about a 21-day fast. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Too. So I uh, came in here, had a carrot and— Orange juice smoothie this morning, and okay, about to have another <laughs> smoothie <laughs> later. Well, and, how far yep. in are you? Uh, just one week. So we have two more weeks. It ends on Super Bowl Sunday, and then I go <laughs> hog wild no, okay. on some pizza did and you wings. Guys, did and, you plan that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, they plan, it. they plan it every every uh, year like that. Okay, so, all but, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but you know, it really does. It, again, it, it gets me talking, and, and that's it's almost perfect timing that right. uh, I'm talking with you guys today because it's a lot of perspective and it's mm-hmm. it's thinking about do we really have things so bad in our world? And you mentioned like a dark world, and it's like, man, do we have things things great? And and something I've started doing is just writing down. Um, thoughts or Bible verses and putting them up on my mirror. And again, it just, it changes your whole start to the day, your perspective. And yeah. and hopefully what I love get going to the ballpark every day. So I wake up, first thing I'm thinking about is, you know, my wife and kids and what I have to do with them in the morning. And then mm-hmm. um, can't wait to get to the baseball field. So yeah. uh, it's one thing that I, you know, after, you know, being in the business world and kind of hedging, right? We mentioned hedging earlier. Mm-hmm. I finally made a decision, you know, after after praying and talking with my wife and made a decision that I was going to follow my passion and, you know, potentially leave behind that lucrative, you know, financially, um, I guess, you know, uh, good business behind to follow my passion. Right. And I know that's a struggle for a lot of people, but again, it's putting things into perspective. It's, it's why do you need, you know, the financial part of having the the business, I guess the business life would have put me in a great spot financially for myself, my kids. But at the end of the day, I thought I want my wife and kids looking at me, not that I've set them up necessarily with finances, but that I'm pursuing my passion and that I'm doing something I love. And it's not always easy it's because again, even going to our 18 to 22 year old kids, right? They see the external, they try to, to match themselves up or, or compare themselves to the others they see mm-hmm. and then live those lives versus no, no, no. Live the life that you want, make oh, decisions yeah. that you want to make, right? To live your own life, to carve your own path. So yeah. that's kind of, it, it's, it's renewed me over the past year and, and things have come to fruition. And, you know, I'm excited about our baseball team really. And, and, you know, a lot of people ask how we're going to be, and uh, I'm excited. I think we have a chance to be really good. And um, I joke with them. I think our pitching staff will pretty good, be pretty good if the pitching coach doesn't screw it up, <laughs> you know, joking <laughs> with them, but uh, uh, no, but good. right now, yeah, there's a lot of, of great things going on. I'm going to bring and, you back to something you said, but Jeff. I, yeah. I just, when you mentioned, you know, your passion, Mm -hmm. when, when someone, when you, me, Eric, um, are able to pursue our passion, how does that impact the people around us? When you're doing what you really are meant to do? Sure. I, I guess it's hard because what you think people see you as and judge you by how much money you have the cars you drive the whatever it's really not like you're trying to impress and again i heard this from someone you're trying to impress the people for the most part that you may not even really like so right? so that that inner circle that's that's that, the people right, i'm that talking Eric about, about who, yeah. who are how does it affect them your relationship with them the Oh, I, I think it'll help all the relationships because, again, I think you're just being real with who you are. You're not trying to to have a facade up. Um, the people closest to you are going to see you, and, and and it's going to come out. You can t- I hopefully you can tell the excitement I have when I talk I about see that. this stuff, right? And I'm I'm leaning over the chair because <laughs> I'm truly passionate about it. So when people interact with me, I hope they feel that, right? And that's something I listen to to Craig Rochelle's podcast and he talks about you know be real because uh leaders and and people are always going to follow leaders who are real not ones that are always right 
that's kind of his his mantra mm-hmm. or what he says before and after the podcast. But man, I really take that to heart. And I it's because you see someone that has a facade up that's not real, and a lot of times you question, well, what are are they trying to be somebody else? Are they trying to live for somebody else's? And it's not easy. And what I what I say is, you know, perspective because people you know, get to 30 years old and think, I can't make the switch now. I can't do that now. It's like, well, you might have to to jumble up some priorities. Yeah. And, right. And you know what, Dan? I, I the, One of the things you said earlier, uh, and this is, uh, I mean, I, I know culturally this in America, we're enamored with output. Mm-hmm. We're enamored with the things that are visible, like, oh, you're a this and you have that. Wow. I want to, I want to follow my passion too. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. We don't spend a ton of time like, tell us about when you had to ride those crickety old buses and you were in those little towns and then you got a call the next day that said, well, we've traded you or you know what? You were going to start, but we're, we've changed things and it's year number three. And you've been like, oh my gosh, what am I? The sleepless nights, the injuries, the, all that stuff, right? Sure. Because I'm here to say, I'm all for following your passion, but you better get ready because it's, it's going to hurt. And it's hard. Mm-hmm. And if it was not truly a passion, it'd be easy, sure. you know? And I, I hear you say that and I'm going, and I, obviously I know your backstory more than our listeners. I'm going, this is not a guy who's just going, well, you know, it's important to be passionate about what you believe in mm-hmm. and following that passion. No, right. it, there's a lot. And if we had, I mean, we'll have you back. That's, mm-hmm. that's how we'll do that. All right, right. The next show, it'll be, sure. tell us all about the sure. crap you had to go sure. through, right? <laughs> no, but it, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Like, And you may fail. I, I, I'm not here to tell you you're always going to succeed. And there's p- probably plenty of failure stories out there. But, yeah. you know, the failure is just going to lead you to your next success. Yes, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, but you're right. It, it's, you know, my first stint in pro ball, I was making $1,100 a month and riding 15 hour bus rides. And it's not what you, uh, it's not what you, the glamorous life when you think of major league baseball mm-hmm. and hundreds yeah. and millions of dollars, you know, getting thrown out there. So uh, yeah, I, that's a great point. That couldn't be understated because, you know, we're, I don't want to set this up like, you're always going to succeed at these things, and it's always going to oh, be easy. You know what? That's one of no. that's one of the reasons why uh, I love baseball. Mm-hmm. Is that if you think about, let's see, I uh, got to remember it was who won this, uh, the World Series last year? The Nationals. Yes, the Nationals. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't know what was their record. They lost what? They probably lost more than sixty games. They were right? in the play, the Brewers almost beat them in the should have probably beat them in the play in game, okay. the wild card game. All right, but but their actual regular season records you lose sixty Average. games, yeah. Yep. And and yep. you think about that. Yeah. You lost 60 times. Mm-hmm. You went to the ballpark, you played 9 innings, you lost you did 60 times. Mm-hmm. Right? That's, to me it's like that's a mirror of life. Right. And cuz I know my record. Right. <laughs> my record is I'm more like the Nationals. I'm <laughs> okay. not I'm not some 120 game winning sure. team, right? Sure. But I I guess not only does that prove and and test that that wiring, that calling, that passion or whatever, but it puts you in that place where you go, you know, we get so, we get fooled by this idea that I'm supposed to be that. I'm supposed to go there. I'm supposed Mm -hmm. to do that job. And then the years just unfurl. And then you wake up going, where did Eric go? Has anyone seen Eric? Mm -hmm. No, he's, he's back like miles and miles. You kind of left him there. Mm -hmm. And I know in our work, our passion, right? Hey, Jeff, mm-hmm. it's to help people discover, and I know it's your noble goal, say it. The art within themselves. Right. That's Jeff's. That's not official company. That's Jeff's, and it's a great one because <laughs> we're trying in so many ways to please be you. Just just be you. And, 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 and you know what? To your point, the people that really care about what kind of car you're driving, they really don't care about you. Mm-hmm. They really don't. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, any of my experiences, the people that were hanging with me when I had all of X and Y and Z, mm-hmm. well, when it went south and it was gone, silence. They were gone. Too. Crickets. Mm-hmm. They were gone. They were off to the next party. Mm-hmm. Sure. And as tough a lesson as that was for me, it helped me realize it was, it was kind of like, again, why don't, why don't you just be you? You know, because in the end, that's where it's going to matter. 
Dan, we have loved sitting and talking with you. And I mean it. We'll have you back. Because yes. I want to talk about some of the input stuff. Because I know you got stories. <laughs> yeah, pl- plenty of them. But uh, no, I appreciate it. This is great. I, You know, a lot of fun and a lot of good insight. Oh, perfect, perfect. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in to the Spirit of EQ podcast. And we will talk to you soon. Thanks for subscribing and listening to the Spirit of EQ podcast with Jeff East and Eric Pennington. Spirit of EQ is a preferred partner of Six Seconds, the Emotional Intelligence Network. Six Seconds is a nonprofit organization researching what works in emotional intelligence. Best practices are shared through methods and tools that are global, scientific, and transformational. To find out more about Spirit of EQ or to request a speaker, go to spiritofeq.com. Our contact information is in the podcast show notes as well. And now for our special offer. Hi, this is Jeff again. I just want to let everybody know that if you have any questions or want more information about anything we've talked about, just send me a quick email. My email is jeff at spiritofeq.com and I'll get right back with you. Thanks.